Then the description of the window fireside, where the aged grandam narrates to the circle of children that hangs on her lips story after story of ghosts and fairies, and inspires her audience with a pleasing terror. But we're never allowed to know what the stories were. Here, then, is a problem which has long obsessed me, but I see no way of solving it finally. The aged grandams are gone, and the collectors of folklore began their work too late to save most of the actual stories which the grandams told. Yet such things don't easily die quite out. And imagination, working on scattered hints, may be able to devise a picture of just such an evening's entertainment. Let's see now. There's the fire burning brightly in the large stone fireplace. On the one side sits the squire exhausted by a long day after the partridges and replete with food and drink. On the other side, his old mother sits with her knitting and the children, Charles and Fanny, are gathered about her knee. Oh, I want to wind Granny's yarn. You did it last time. No, you did it twice before that. Oh, well, that doesn't count because... Oh, now, now, my dears, you must be very good and quiet. Or you'll wake your father. And you know what will happen then. Oh, yes, I know. And he won't be cross-tempered and send us off to bed. What's that? Fie on you, Charles. That's not a way to speak. Now, I was to have told you a story. But if you use such like words, I shan't. Oh, oh Granny, oh, please. Oh, Granny. Oh, oh, please, we'll be shh, 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 shh. Oh, now I do believe you have woken your father. Uh, hey, look there, Mother. You, you can keep them brats quiet. Yes, John, yes, yes, it's too bad. I've been telling them if it happens again, off to bed they shall go. There now. You see, children, what did I tell you? You must be good and sit still. And I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you shall go a blackberry. Oh, and, God, and, and if you bring home a nice basket full, I'll make you some jam. Oh, yes, Granny, do. And, and I know where the best blackberries are. I, I saw them today. Oh, and where's that, Charles, dear? Uh, I know too, Granny. It's, it's in the little lane. Well, it's in the little lane that goes up past Collins' cottage. Charles? Fanny? Whatever you do... Don't you dare to pick one single blackberry in that lane. Don't you know? There, how should you? What was I thinking of? Well, anyway, you both mind what I say. Oh, no, 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 why, Granny? Why shouldn't we pick them? Why shouldn't we pick them? Shh. Remember what I told your father. But, but Granny, why? why? Very well, then. I'll tell you about it. Only you mustn't interrupt. Here, Fanny, you can take the knots out of this skein for Granny. Uh, now, let me see. Oh, my, sounds like a storm blowing up outside, doesn't it, children? Well, no matter. We're safe and warm inside, aren't we? Well, now, that lane. All this, mind you, happened when I was quite a little girl. That lane was feared even then, and as far back as anyone can remember. And if something that happened to your granny on that lane is any indication, I've often wondered if there was any connection between what I saw and all that about Mr. Davis and his friend that I'm about to tell you. What did you see, Granny? Yes, what did you see, Granny? What did you see? Well, you know that lane passes near to the top of that hill uh, where you've seen that old figure cut out in the crag. Well, I was passing along there one evening 
I was already late getting home for my supper. But I remember seeing the currant and gooseberry bushes along the side leading to the top of the hill. The berries were ever so ripe and delicious. And before I realized, I had followed them, tasting one bush, then another, near to the top of the hill. Then I stopped for a moment. I was sure I heard something. Voices, I thought. But I I couldn't make out plainly because of the wind. I couldn't make out whether they were coming from the top of the hill or from inside. Somewhere inside the hill itself, voices singing or calling or something. I wasn't frightened at all at first, and I remember walking farther up to see where the sounds were coming from, and the farther up I went, the more it seemed the voices were coming from all around me, from below as well as above. strange old rocks around the top of that hill. Well, beside one of those rocks, and no one believed me when I told the story later, or made out they didn't believe me. Well, what I saw was a hand, a whole arm reaching up from out of the earth. could very well be unearthed by the rain. <laughs> but that was no skeleton arm. There was flesh on it, dark and old, and long nails, all like claws. Now you can believe me or not, but I say I saw that arm reaching up out of the earth. And it wasn't a dead arm. When I came nearer, I saw its fingers moving like it was in pain, like it was beckoning me to help it. The best of it, out of the earth. Now, I, I told you that I wasn't afraid, and that's true, until I got so close. Terrible fear overcame me, and I ran, ran all the way down the hill. And I have never once set foot on that place since. Well, now, it was only a short while after that that the events I was going to tell you about began. Uh, careful, Fanny, not too close to the fire with that yarn. That's better. Well, now, up at the far end of that lane, let, let me see, is it on, is it on the right or the left-hand side as you go up? Oh, yes, the left-hand side. You find a little patch of bushes and rough ground in the field, and something like a broken old hedge round about, and the kind of gooseberry and currant bushes I told you about growing among. Well, that means there was a cottage stood there, of course. And in that cottage, there lived a man named Davis. This Mr. Davis lived very much to himself. He, he didn't work for any of the farmers, having, as it seemed, enough money of his own to get along. But he'd go to town on market days. And one day he came back from market and brought a young man with him. And this young man and he lived together for some long time and, and went about together. 
and whether he just did the work of the house for Mr. Davis, or whether Mr. Davis was his teacher in some way, nobody seemed to know. He was a pale young man and hadn't much to say for himself. Well, now, what did those two men do with themselves? <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, I can't tell you half the foolish things that the people got into their heads. And we know, don't we, that you mustn't speak evil when you aren't sure it's true, even when people are dead and gone. But as I said, those two were always about together, late and early, and there's one walk that they take regularly to the place on the hill that I just told you about. And it was noticed that in the summertime, they'd camp out there all night. I remember once my father, that's your great-grandfather, told me he had spoken to Mr. Davis and his young friend one evening when he met them on the road. He asked them why they were so fond of going up there. Why? Why, sir, it's a wonderful old place. And I've always been fond of the old-fashioned things. And when him, my boy here and me are together there, it seems to bring back the old times, the plain. Well, it may suit you, but I shouldn't like to be in a lonely place like that in the middle of the night. Oh, sir, we don't want the company at such time. That is to say, Mr. Davies and me is company enough for each other. Ain't it so, Master? Aye. Then there's a beautiful air there of a summer night, and you can see all the country around under the moon. Oh. It looks so different, seemingly, from what it do in the daytime. The bars there, and the mounds, all over up there. Now, what would you think was the purpose of them, sir? Why, I've heard, Mr. Davis, that they're all graves. And I know when I've had occasion to plow up one, there's always been some old bones and pots turned up. But whose graves they are, I don't know. People say the ancient Romans were all about this country at one time. But whether they buried the people like that, I can't tell. Ah, oh, to be sure. Well, they look to me to be older like than the ancient Romans. And dress different. Uh, that's to say, according to the pictures, the Romans was in armor. And you didn't never find no armor, did you, sir? I mean, not by what you said. Well, I don't know that I mentioned anything about armor. But it's true, I don't remember to have found any. But you'll talk as if you'd seen them, Mr. Davis. Seen them, sir? That would be a difficult matter after all these years. Not but what I should like well enough to know more about them old times and people, and what they worshipped and all. Worshipped? Well, I dare say I've heard and read about them heathens and their worship, torture and dances, behavior lewd and ungodly, sacrifices. How torture and dances, you say? Sacrifices, you say. Lewd and ungodly behavior. What manner do you suppose? Read about them, you say. Hasten, you say. That was the only time my father had much talk with Mr. Davis. It was around that time that people believed some sort of meetings went on at night time on that hill. And that those who went there were up to no good. And there was known to be others besides Mr. Davis and his young man, I mean. And it was only guessed what really went on. Yarn, Fanny dear. Now mind what I say, else you find yourself going up in flames. Oh, 
Don't stretch that skein so, Charles. Hold it loosely. That's it. Well, now. Well, I suppose it was a matter of three years that Mr. Davis and this young man went on living together. And then, all of a sudden, a dreadful thing happened. I don't know if I ought to tell you what it was. Well, then, you must promise not to get frightened and go screaming out into the middle of the night. No, we won't. We won't. Of course we will. Well, one morning, very early, towards the turn of the year, I think it was in September, one of the woodmen had gone up to his work near the hillside just as it was getting light. And what he saw nearly drove the poor man out of his wits. He dropped everything he was carrying and, and ran as hard as ever he could straight down to the parsonage and woke up old Mr. White. A parson. The parson White. The parson White. What is this man? Oh, Quiet glory be. What's the master with you? Oh, Parson, sir. Come with me quickly. It's Lord horrible. It's horrible. Man. Oh, but what? you must come with me to see what's been done. What's been done? Oh, Miss Willie, really it down it. Tell me what it is, man. What have you oh, seen? Oh, in, in the little woods near the hill. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. oh so I, I was going up to my work, and, and I saw it in a clearing. A, a white thing, what, what looked like uh, through the mist. A white like a man. Uh, like a man, sir. And, and when I came near, I saw it was a man. Mr. Davies, young man, sir. What? Oh, he, he, he was dressed in a sort of white gown, sir. And, oh, as he was, it? and he was hanging by his neck to the limb of the biggest oak. Quite, quite dead, sir. No, he be. But, but, but the real horrible thing, sir, was his hands. Uh, oh, oh, I don't think there were any hands. What? No, I, I couldn't rightly see for, for the blood, sir. Oh, the blood. May the Lord bless us and save us. What a sight to behold. A demon's work if ever I saw on himself before us. His left hand chopped clean off. Oh, if clean we can call it. Maybe cleansed would be the word for it. Cleansed. But for the right. Blood. Blood. Oh, no, they just below. I hadn't seen before. Look, sir. What? Oh. The hatchet, oh, the hatchet on the ground the here, stuck with blood and bits of flesh. Horrible. Huh? Some flies on it already. Oh, don't touch it, don't oh. touch it. Do you think, sir, that this is a murder? It's an abomination. Oh. An abomination, but I think it's his own act. I think so. You I see here the rock over here? Uh -huh. he, he could have jumped from it and... Oh. Yes, it must have been. You can see the... Saints, the blood, the hand. Aye, sir, tis the hand where he chopped it off. And there it lies. Oh, a sight, sir. Such a thing. Oh, and do you see, sir? Do you see it is grasping something? So it is. What with all so the blood can you make it out? Oh. It seems, it seems flesh. It seems part of a living body. Oh, sir, what do you think? God's mercy. Oh. I think it's no living body whose part this be. This is Mr. Davis's man, you say, on the tree. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, I think we'd best, best find uh, what we can of, of Mr. Davis himself. Oh, yes, sir. We'd better hurry up. Come now. Come on, sir. The cottage is down there. Oh, oh, on the hill, you see, in the, in the field. Oh, well, now, the door of the cottage stood wide open, and the two men rushed in, not knowing what horrors to expect. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis. Then they came to the little room which served as a parlor. Oh, oh bless us and save us. What oh, they look, saw. Oh, look. oh, they would not forget the sight for the rest of their lives. What is is well, there in the center of the room work of the devil's own devil was a table. The 
it had been set up as a kind of altar or place of torture and stretched across his feet in clamps attached to the foot and his wrists held at the corners above his head, spread out naked, facing upwards, lay Mr. Davis, his body almost in shreds from a whip which lay beside him, a tangle of blood and flesh. But the worst of it, oh, the worst of it, the worst. The axe, just below the breast bone, the body had been sliced as far down and torn open, and inside the axe had hacked and slashed away. A uh, part of the spine stuck up, but nothing else was recognizable except the blood. Oh, the blood everywhere. And the strangest thing of all... Do you see the, uh, the face, Woodman? Eyes, sir. The most horrible part. Like a mark on it. The eyes staring oh. up. With the mouth open into a terrible grin. Oh. oh! Did you see that twitch? Yes. The man... The man can't still be alive. Oh, and no. Breathing. And, and, and trying to speak, it seemed. Oh. Both men lean close to hear... And swore later what they heard, though no one could make sense of it. But they swore they saw the mouth move and the words barely audible come forth. Ah, again, again, more, more, more. Well, now, Fanny, you're shivering, dear, and so close to the fire. Uh, you should fetch a woolly from upstairs, dear. Uh, no, Granny. I'm not cold. Well, here, you put Granny's shawl around you anyway. <sighs> That's it. Now... Well, did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Oh, that they did. And his young man together. That very night, but not in hallowed ground, as Parson White would have none of that, but up on the hill. And it was no proper burial either. Some of the men just dug a hole large enough and gathered rocks. Only those few men needed for the task were there. They heard the bell. It's not coming from the church, Parson. No, we can all hear. It's coming from inside the hill. The coming of them of their own of the grave, we could swear, but for the darkness and only the candles lighting, we struck things that screamed and pulled oh, themselves God, deeper into the earth. Oh, we, we've no place here. This isn't the Lord's ground. Quickly now, throw the bodies in. Couple them with rocks. Uh, be away now, couple them. They did. But it wasn't exactly the end of the story. What what happened then, Granny? What's that sound, Granny? Do you hear it? Ah, the sound. I'm coming to that. Well, next morning, some of the town folks passing by saw those strange black patches on the road leading up the hill like a trail. They, they look to be alive like. Oh, how could they be? But they shimmer so. And when they went closer... Oh, God preserve us. Flies. Thousands of huge flies. Oh, look what they've been feeding on. 
patches of blood from those bodies that were rolled up last Why? night. Why? Where did they come from? Well, there's never been so many flies about. Oh, look! Lifting up all along. Oh, the sky is black with that. Oh, 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 They found the women, swollen beyond recognition, almost changed in shape, you might say, looking more like them horrible half-animal monsters you see pictures of in ancient books. But almost as fast as they came, they were gone, the blood clean from the road, and as some folks swore, Taken back by the flies into the hill. Now, Charles. Yes, Granny. And Fanny. Yes, Granny. Now, I want you to pay special attention to what I'm going to tell you. You remember my saying about them blackberry bushes not to pick a single blackberry? Yes, yes, Granny. Well... From what I'm going to tell you now, you can judge for yourselves. Now, I said those flies went back into the hill, or wherever they came from. But that wasn't the end of it. Some of them is always seen about up there. And it was one day, while I was courting your grandfather, we were walking up there among those very bushes, and one of them berries, at least I thought it was, seemed to come alive in my hand. I felt the sting that couldn't open my hand. Now I can only say what I know. A numbness went over me. I heard sounds. Then something like a terrible whip. I can't remember all that happened. Father says he had to hold me from doing things. And it was his own words that the very devil had gotten into me. Later, when I opened my hand and wiped the awful insect away, I couldn't tell whether the blood had come from me or the demon itself. So you both mind what I say and find your blackberries down in the hollow near the creek. Oh, but, but look at the time. Off with you. Off with you to bed. Oh, oh Granny. Granny. Off with you now. Granny, can, can we have a candle tonight? A candle? Certainly not. Now, off with you, and, and Granny will come and tuck you in later. Go on. Oh, oh Granny, oh, and, and no, Charles, the early Charles, time. don't you frighten your sister up oh. there in the dark, or there'll be no more stories for you. Oh, oh. Uh, Mother, what's that? Oh, I've just sent them off to bed. Oh, you've been telling them those stories again. You, you know, Mother, that none of them is true. Where do you? get them from? Well, some of it's true, and the rest... Well, it's like I take hold of something. We pull gently, and the rest comes up all of its own. Mm. Well, well, I couldn't tell you where it comes from. Uh, I'm going to my bed, too. <laughs> uh, you'll see to locking up, Mother. Well, uh, good night. Well, I'll see to it. Good night, Sonny. a little while longer.
We've just heard an evening's entertainment by M.R. James. Pat Franklin as Granny. Frank Laverde as Granny's father. Don LePage as Mr. Davis. Bernard Mays as the narrator and Parsons White. And Parson White. Eric Bowersfeld as the young man, the woodman, and the sleeping father. Arlene Sagan and Marion Winch as the children. Technical production by John Whiting.